My name is Kathy Aros, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. Welcome to our first completely virtual voter education program. The name of the program is Save Our Saguaros, and today we will be learning about a significant threat facing our beautiful Sonoran Desert community in both our rural and urban areas. That threat is an invasive species called buffalo grass, which grows rapidly and is displacing our native plants. We have a wonderful panel of experts and activists to speak to you today. So without further ado, I would like to present today's moderator, past president of the Greater Tucson League, Vivian Hart. Vivian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. We're very pleased to have you seeing this program. It's the very first voter education program of the 2020-2021 season. So first, I would like to introduce our speakers today. Save Our Saueros. Now this is a voter education program that is co-sponsored by the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum and the Arizona Native Plant Society. See our beautiful saueros. Those are beautiful plants that are, they are at risk right now. Now this is buffalo grass. Look at those seeds. Oh, they're happy too in the desert. So our first speaker is Julia Rowe. She is the Invasive Species Program Coordinator and also the Director of the Sonoran Desert Cooperative Weed Management Area. This area is a collaborative effort between various agencies and stakeholders to provide outreach and educational programs about invasive species in our desert. Julia will explain the insidious linkages between buffalo grass and the future of our beautiful saguaro giant cacti. She is a broadly trained restoration ecologist. She has a background in population monitoring and restoration of bird species. Her PhD from the University of Hawaii, Manoa, focused on restoration of seabird populations. Perry Grissom is a restoration ecologist at Saguaro National Park, and he's been in that position since 2017. He is responsible for the management of non-native plants in the park, where the vast majority of his time is devoted to buffalo grass control. He will describe the scope of the buffalo grass problem, the tools that the park is using to attempt to beat back buffalo grass, and the outlook for future control. Perry holds a BS from the University of Arizona and an MS from Texas Tech University. He has almost 20 additional years of experience in wildland fire for Saguaro National Park and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Marilyn Hansen spent 34 years teaching science in Madison, Wisconsin. She moved to Tucson in 2000 and she entered the DOSA program at the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum and began volunteering for the Buffalo Grass Weed Whacking Group. 20 years later, she is still deeply involved in buffalo grass control efforts. And she writes about the work on the Sonoran, Sonoran Desert Weed Whackers website. She will discuss the role of citizens in addressing the buffalo grass threat. The Weed Whackers subscribe to Gary Snyder's words, find your place on the planet, dig in and take responsibility from there, which is exactly what she has done. Bridget Walters is an eighth grade student in Tucson. She became interested in eradicating buffalo grass and fountain grass after receiving the Buffalo Busters coloring book from the Pima County Department of Environmental Quality when she was still in elementary school. She has led two buffalo grass and fountain grass poles, one at her high school and one on Forest Service land. 
Bridget wants to work on environmental issues in high school to help educate her peers. And now please welcome Julia Rowe. Hi, good morning. I'm Julia and I'm excited to talk to you all about buffalo grass in the Tucson Basin area. Here is a gorgeous picture of saguaros in the Tucson Basin. So the city of Tucson has grown tremendously over the past hundred years. Uh, from a small town of fewer than 10,000 people in 1900s to a city of over half a million people today. Uh, the local topography is defined by isolated mountain ranges surrounded by alluvial slopes and separated by flat basins. Uh, the predominant vegetation in these basin, basins is biologically diverse Sonoran desert scrub composed of small trees uh, such as Palo Verde and ironwood, shrubs, succulents, and the most famous of these is the saguaro cactus. These are amazing plants that can live to be over 200 years old. And it's one of the things that makes Tucson so unique and that people love so much about this place. But we are not here to talk about how amazing the Sonoran Desert is. We're talking about a major threat to the Sonoran Desert and to the saguaro cactuses. Buffalo grass was brought to Tucson back in the 1930s when scientists were looking for a miracle grass that could withstand the heat and drought that they were experiencing at the time and that comes along with living in a desert. And they did a great job. They found a grass that uh, is very resistant to extreme heat and drought and it escaped the areas where they were cultivating it and studying it and now has spread across the Tucson Basin and up most of our mountainsides. In 2005, it was listed as a prohibited noxious weed. And so what that means is essentially it's not legal to sell it, to plant it, to have it on your property. Uh, and that's an acknowledgement of how damaging this weed can be to our ecosystem. And just this year, it's uh, nasty cousin fountain grass was also added to the noxious weed list. It's closely related to buffalo grass, and it's mostly in this area spreads through the riparian areas. But I want everyone to keep in mind that pretty much everything I say about buffalo grass, for the most part, also holds true for fountain grass. And as you get further north, you'll see you see the fountain grass outside of the riparian areas and up on hillsides as well. So this is a really nice picture, right? This is our Sonoran Desert. The thing I really want you to notice in this picture is all the open space. You see succulents, you see uh, prickly pear, you see uh, you know, lots of trees, but there's a lot of open space in between those plants. This is a picture of Sonoran Desert with buffalo grass having moved in. And so it's taken up all of that empty space here and filled it up with buffalo grass. And so for the most part, probably three quarters of the year, buffalo grass is this dry brown grass and it carpets many areas where it moves into. And so one of the most critical and pressing issues that it brings with it is that it changes the fire regime in the Sonoran Desert. The Sonoran Desert naturally is more like the first picture. You have desert scrub, uh, you've got a lot of space in between your plants, the plants typically have very small leaves, fire just doesn't spread very far when it happens, and these plants are not adapted to handle fire. But in the second picture, when you have a few non-native uh, grasses such as buffalo grass move in, especially buffalo grass move in, and fill in some of those spaces, suddenly your fire is going to is burning hotter than it normally would, and I'll speak to that in a moment, but also it moves a lot farther than it would. would. So your fire uh, has just changed from being maybe half an acre or a little bit larger to being tens of thousands of acres. And the especially insidious thing about this fire regime change is that once the fire happens, 
the thing that's first able to come back is the buffel grass. And so within a very short period of time, you've gone from the first picture of a de desert scrub ecosystem to the last picture that is purely invaded grassland. And so when I mentioned that the fires burn really hot, they actually tested this and in Avra Valley where they have just whole fields full of buffalo grass, they tested the heat of the fire and the buffalo grass fires are burning at 13 to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit as compared to our native plants that are burning much lower at 190 to 700 degrees, 750 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a really big difference in just the heat of the fire itself. And so most fires, when I've gone out to see them after uh, a, a large buffalo grass area has burned, it's this interesting, uh, it burns it right down to rock. And so you see in these pictures, you just see, you know, just a rock landscape. And when I first started working on this, uh, on this issue back in 2016, that was about the same time that the A Mountain fire, uh, the most recent A Mountain fire happened. Uh, a lot of you folks will remember that. Fourth of July, fireworks, um, fireworks sparks caught the mountain on, caught the side of the mountain on fire. Uh, fire crews were there to put it out. Uh, it still burned about five acres and uh, about 274 sawars were caught up in that fire. So this is a picture pretty soon after and it's that same landscape, right? It's burned right down to fire. Um, the Desert Museum, along with the university, started studying the saguaro mortality in that fire, and so I happened to be out on the slope uh, in the subsequent weeks. So this is really showing that progression that happens after a fire. If you guys remember back then, we had, pretty soon after the fire, we had some rain, which is not uncommon for July. And this is just a few weeks after that fire. The only green that you're seeing in this picture is buffalo grass. And the thing is, is that it sprouts right back up from the roots, right? So it doesn't have to wait for seeds to, to be carried into this area. And this is about six weeks later. And so you can see in this picture that it's already got seed heads. So it's the first thing that's come back. It's already producing seed. And if you drive past this site and you look up on the hill, you can see the outline of the fire because the only things growing in that area now, there's a few saguaro that have survived, but for the, the lower vegetation is all buffalo grass. So that's how it creates this really quick changeover from you know, a natural scrub Sonoran desert system to a buffalo grass system. And so when this then spends most of its, most of the year in a very dry state, it just perpetuates itself. This is another picture from the Mercer fire that just happened in 2019. And the thing I want to draw your attention to is not only the burnt and fallen saguaro, which is very sad, but can you see, it's just a couple weeks after this fire that we went out there in the foreground, can you see these plants? These are buffalo grass that are coming back. The only thing that's green in this picture, again, is buffalo grass. And so the fire not only wipes out all of its competition, but it also creates it, uh, a nitrogen boost for it. So it's getting fertilized and it's getting all of its competition moved out of the way. So it really thrives in the fire that it creates for itself. This is another picture from the Mercer fire. And again, you can see all of this is buffalo grass. These green little sprouty bits is all buffalo grass starting in already. But it's not just in the wildland ecosystems, right? So it's obviously very sad to, you know, to think of it in uh, creating fire in our wildland areas but it's also dangerous and creates problems in our urban system. And it's an equal opportunity invasive. It's in all the different socioeconomic levels of Tucson. Everything that's not a, a tree 
basically in this picture, the, the golden color here, this is buffalo grass yeah, moving down the slope, well, probably moving up the slope. And here's a really great example of how it's connecting the wildland and the urban interface. So the circles are showing buffalo grass. And this is actually from, I think, 2014, and this extent is much larger at this point. But you can see it's in the urban areas, it's in the wildland areas, and these are, it's connecting these two areas. So if we were to have a wildfire here, it would not be difficult for it to make that jump. And there's a lot of houses right at that interface, especially as you're in the, right in the Catalina foothills. So the other issue with buffalo grass is that even if it never caught on fire, which it probably will, but even if it didn't, it's, we would still lose our saguaros along with a lot of other native plants because you can see how densely this is growing. It's growing so densely that the new plants cannot come up through that. And so the other thing I really want to talk about for a little bit is like, why does that matter? Why do we, why do we care so much if we lose the native plants versus a new novel? Maybe it's a novel ecosystem. Well, I happen to love the, <laughs> the Sonoran Desert, and I know a lot of you guys do too. And the saguaro cactus not only is, is beautiful, but it's such a keystone species for so many birds and animals. Uh, but also, with that loss of diversity, you lose the animals that rely on those specific native plants. You lose the animals that rely on those animals et cetera, et cetera, you know, all the way down your, your trophic cascade. And so the interesting thing is a lot of these animals, even the ungulates, ungulates being a hooved animal, don't care to eat the buffalo grass, uh, probably because it's brown most of the year, but they'll eat anything else before they eat buffalo grass. This is a chart showing a study that was done at U of A and what this is showing you is that for tortoises, their, their weight by size decreases as you have more buffalo grass in an area. So the tortoises are territorial. They don't just move out when buffalo grass moves in, but they, their food source is lost because even with only 20% of the area covered with buffalo grass, they've lost enough of their food source to be losing weight, essentially. Which is really sad, because I think we all love the, the desert tortoise. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, it can be controlled. Uh, there's a lot of people out there digging it up. Um, and obviously, if you go out and dig it up, we already talked about the roots. You have to get the roots out as well. And there's people spraying it. And those are pretty much the only tools we have in our toolbox at this point. There is research going into other methods to try and uh, control it, but it's still in very early stages. So who's gonna control it, right? Um, we're anticipating a shift from federal to more state and local control of our, of our lands and areas. Um, large land changes and human footprints and the burden of stewardship has been shifting over the last number of years to local municipalities and NGOs. This is just a map showing the various agencies that are responsible for the different lands. Um, one of the things, one of the major things that we've been working on at the Desert Museum is how to build these collaborations across these different groups to really be able to control this and to get some really good work and sustainable work done. This is a map just really, I, I, this is in here just to show how many different entities control the lands that buffalo grass doesn't care if it's state or federal or county or private land, it grows everywhere. And so a lot of our time at the Desert Museum is trying to work on these collaborations to really get these projects moving forward. Um, yeah, these are just some of, the, some of the groups that we work with. And, uh, and it's been, it's really rewarding actually getting uh, a lot of these groups working together and communicating with each other. That's a, a, a high point of my job. 
Um, these are some of the people that work in a cooperative weed management area with us uh, that we were talking about. So we have even Forest Service, City of Tucson, a lot of places you would assume, but we even have Freeport McMoran and some other private groups uh, working with us as well. And that's really, uh, keeps us really hopeful. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if other people are gonna show you this today, but I just wanted to give a super quick buffalo grass characteristics. Uh, the bottle brush inflorescence is super important. The clumping is really important, the hairy armpits. Um, but there's identification guides on our website for the Desert Museum, and you're always welcome to go out on a pull. Uh, with, uh, which is really the best. If you want to learn what it looks like, go on a pull and pull with people that know what it is. Um, and I, I can't uh, leave this talk without highlighting a little bit some of the volunteers and the volunteer efforts, which are a huge, huge part of what's happening in the Tucson Basin. So this is, this is an example of Trails and Wash before digging, and this is after. And it's a really huge difference, right? Um, and Suara National Park utilizes a lot of volunteers, but they put a lot of effort into um, spraying as well. I'm not going to get into that because we've got Perry Grissom here to talk about that. Um, and I just wanted to mention, again, Marilyn's going to talk to you a little bit more, but we're just always so impressed with the work that they've been doing for over 20 years. And there's a lot of different groups that get people out on the hill learning about and digging buffalo grass. And it's so important, even if you can't go out every month or you know, even if you only go out once, just to learn it, touch it, understand it is, is really key. And so I just wanna visit back. I know this is a lot of text on this slide, but these are some of the things that we're thinking about all the time at the Desert Museum. Um, which spots do we work on? Who makes the decisions on where to work? Uh, who bears the cost and responsibility? It is a huge problem. Um, how do we know if we're succeeding? How long is our commitment? Um, one of the things that we have to think about when we're thinking about buffalo grass is that whether you pull it or whether you spray it, you have to commit to at least three to five years, if not really longer than that. Um, it's, not a, it's not a one and done effort. You know, you really have to stay with it. And so where do those resources go? Um, and you're going to hear more about where some of those resources go in some of the other talks. But for those of you listening who maybe are part of a neighborhood HOA or just in a neighborhood, you can go for a neighborhood walk and see if you can find it. Um, you can get in touch with uh, any of the people that are doing buffalo grass pulls, and we do have some. You can go to desertmuseum.org and find out what, what polls are happening and join one. And if you ever have any buffalo grass questions, reach out to the Desert Museum and I'm always happy to answer them. And with that, I'll send it back to Vivian. Thank you very much, Julia. That was very educational. Julia is the Invasive Species Program Coordinator for the Desert Museum. Our next presenter is Perry Grissom. He's the restoration ecologist at Saguaro National Park, and he has been in that position since 2017. Perry. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Vivian, and thanks to the League of Women Voters for the invitation to talk today. And I am, oh, and my biography is not quite right. Um, I had 20 years in other agencies in fire and plus 10 years um, with the park service. So 30 years in fire. I, I started when I was five. We could do that in the old days. Um, so, and I did part of that time. I worked in South Texas at National Wildlife Refuges and I actually fought buffalo grass fires. So I was kind of dismayed when I moved back to Tucson and found it here. So this is a map of Saguaro National Park, which I'm gonna talk about today. Um, Julia's talk was very comprehensive, pretty depressing at the beginning, but a little inspiration at the back. So the main, the main purpose of this talk is to show what the park is doing and um, show some success stories. So in general, in, for an invasive species when they come in, invasive means that it will take over as much of the, it's aggressive, more aggressive than the native plants, it'll take over um, 
all the habitat that it finds suitable and covered up. And that could be, you know, if it's very specialized, that might be a small area. If it's, if it's not that specialized, it could be a huge area like buffalo grass. And these, this, so this is over time, these, these are time periods. It could be a year or it could be 10 years. So initially a plant is introduced, um, then it survives. It starts producing seeds, they survive, make more seeds, you get little colonies forming. They, they expand, they start new colonies, sometimes far away. And eventually, you know, this curve, this, this species is doubling in every time period, this example. And so you don't really notice it until it really starts to get in here and it just explodes all of a sudden. You realize you have a problem and then pretty soon it's saturated the whole habitat. So you can think of it as, a, as this ball on this curve. The, the species is trying, is not trying, but is expanding at a rate in this one, it's doubling every time period. And if you don't push back against that ball as hard as that is pushing up, it's gonna keep going up. It may take longer to get to saturation. And if you push it harder than it's pushing, then you push it back down in here and you can keep it under control. So there's various strategies that we use or anybody can use uh, at these different stages of, in, of the invasion process. You could quarantine it, you could try to keep it from getting here. After it's here, if there's just a few, you can go out and kill them and eradicate them. In this middle section, really all the rest of this is you're just trying to control it, trying to hold it down or push it backwards. And you know, when it's saturated, it takes a lot of work. So that's what buffalo grass looks like when it saturates uh, Sonoran Desert. That's the south slope on Tanka Verde Ridge and Sonoran National Park in the Rincon Mountain District. All that yellow is buffalo grass, and you can see the green uh, are puffs or Palo Verde trees, and there are saguaros in there. And yeah, so that's saturated. And as Julia mentioned, you know, it's perennial, it builds fuel, it's tons, literally tons of biomass, it burns really hot. Our native plants are not adapted to it. So what you do, um, you know, same options, pull it, which we have volunteer pulls in the park. And we pay people to do it. We have, this is a conservation, youth conservation core. Um, and they're in, or we have staff or interns, you know, they have hiking boots, they carry more water than your, your average volunteer, so they can stay out all day, they can hike farther into the back country. And then we have our, one of our volunteer programs, uh, the Volunteer Weed Free Trails. The, the, the group pulls are volunteers that may show up, maybe their first time pulling buffalo grass, they don't know what it looks like, so we have to supervise them fairly close. We've had people uh, come that was their first time hiking ever and they really enjoyed it. Um, but the weed-free trail volunteers, they would go out and work on their own, and they, uh, so they receive a higher level, level of training so they can identify a lot of species because we don't want people pulling the wrong things. So the park has been using pulling since 1993, and this, this is about a tenth of an acre of buffalo grass. You can see it tends to make the, like, these little colonies, just a solid block, at which keep expanding outward, and then they send out seeds one way or another, water, wind, on an animal or on a person to a distant spot. So you get these little spots developing, but that's about a tenth of an acre and it took them, these 10 people, a half a day to clear that. Uh, and then the other option really is to spray it and we do it during the monsoon. We use glyphosate, uh, which Julia mentioned, which is absorbed through the leaves. It has to be a green growing leaf to be absorbed to kill it. We spray on the ground. We, for those big saturated patches of solid buffalo grass, we use a boom spray helicopter, and then we just recently added this, a helicopter with a spot sprayer, this little thing here, which I'll talk about all of these more. So this is what ground spraying looks like. So it's during the monsoon, July to September. Um, so we started ground spraying in 2005. Oh, let me run the video. So these big green balls are buffalo grass, and down here, and that shows, I mean, it's very rocky, a lot of cactus, beautiful place, but not really fun to carry a sprayer around on your back. And there's buffalo grass that's just turned blue by getting sprayed. And so, yeah, that's during the monsoon, so that's really hot and humid. You're not getting that sense during the, that video. So, um, but then, you know, we have those big, huge patches and really remote, steep terrain, so. You can't get people up there. Some of that person couldn't even stand up on. So we, in 2014, we started using a helicopter with a 40-foot boom sprayer with these little, each little nozzle, and it puts out raindrop-size 
herbicide mix drops. So these are four by six drift cards that we used when we were calibrating everything. So that's what it looks like. It's kind of big drops. They fall pretty much straight down from the helicopter when they leave the nozzle. They don't travel very far. And, uh, you know, we don't paint the ground. It's spotty like that. And this is a slide one year after aerial spraying. So you can, and we set up some permanent plots in some of these areas that were, were somewhat easy to get to at least. And uh, we re revisit them several years and the data is still being analyzed, but um, you can see with your own eyes, you know, all this yellow and gray, that's dead buffalo grass from, that was killed a year earlier. There's some new buffalo grass coming back. You know, there's a Palo Verde, the saguaros are still mostly intact. There's a little damage in that Palo Verde. There's a brittle bush. You know, some natives, glyphosate does hurt some natives, but these dense patches, keep in mind, there's not much in there. We're not spraying the desert. We're spraying buffalo grass with a few desert plants in it. So this is kind of what a uh, boom spraying also looks like. This picture was taken in 2019. This gray was sprayed in 2018. So you can see there's saguaros, pa Palo Verdes in there, some Ocotillo. There's a uh, Palo Verde looks dead, but uh, you know, doesn't look, you know, we're not killing everything. And then also over here, some gray, but then you can see there was a strip that was green that he missed in 2018, but he came back in 2019, about a week before this photo. And he just flew right down it and sprayed it, killed it. Um, so you can see how it's used. Uh, then we also, in 2018, we started using a spot sprayer, which is also helicopter based. And uh, and it has a spray rig on the bottom of it, which is kind of what would be in the back of a truck, except it's got four nozzles on it pointing downward and it's suspended under the helicopter by a hundred foot cable. And this is the kind of pattern we get with that. It's more complete coverage. He's spraying about, he has that unit about six feet off the ground on average takes a lot of skills. Here's a video of him doing it. And in the red circle, you can see the unit and you can see the buffalo grass turning red from the dye. So that's a very precise application. He's just a few feet off the ground. But you notice that's also pretty slow. And up here on this hill is all this yellow up here, that's buffalo grass that was sprayed with the boom sprayer um, a couple of weeks before. So you can see, I mean, it would take a long time for that spot sprayer to treat that. And then here's an example of the spot spray from a picture from 2019 of what he sprayed in 2018. You can see that the gray is all the dead buffalo grass. Looks like he missed a couple right here, but you know, he's maneuvering in tight spaces around rocks and cacti and getting these places that really people can't get to. Uh, sorry. And here's another, Here's how we use them in combination, the treatments. So this is spot sprayed in 2019. The red dye is really fresh. You can see buffalo grass under these rock faces. And up on the above here, there's the buffalo grass is all yellow. That was boom sprayed two weeks earlier or so. So the spot sprayer came in, the boom sprayer is not precise enough to hit these little patches. He came in and cleaned up. And also in the background, that was boom sprayed in 2018. So that's kind of how those are used in combination. And we, you know, we just started doing that. So some examples of success. Um, this is a, one of our volunteer group polls on one of our Saturdays. We have one on uh, two a month, one on the East District and one on the West in the fall, winter and spring. Um, and you can see here's buffalo grass in the back that we didn't get to. Here's a big pile of it that they just killed and they're all looking very happy. It is very satisfying work. There's a noise that it makes when it rips, when you rip this uh, roots out of the ground when they're breaking off, that's a really satisfying noise. And then the one sign of success is we're running out of the easy patches. Uh, you know, people, you know, volunteers show up, they maybe haven't hiked before in tennis shoes, they don't have much water, so we can't take them to those really steep, far places. Um, so that's a definite sign. We've made a lot of progress in a lot of country, both districts of the park. So here's an example of a success story with the volunteer polls mainly at Freeman Homestead, Rincon Mountain, Rincon Mountain District, and then followed up by ground spring. And this was in 2007, you know, you can see it's kind of filling in. There's, you know, still a lot of natives, but it, the buffalo grass got worse and worse as you went down this drainage. There's very heavy buffalo grass in here. I think about five acres. So five years later, that's what it looked like, the same spot. Um, you know, there's that pair of saguaros. There's this pair. Uh, the natives came back really fast. The buffalo grass hadn't taken over that long. 
Uh, so the native seeds were still alive in the soil and the, you know, a lot of the pl perennial plants were still alive, so it came right back. And, but we did follow up this with ground spraying because to optimize it, to make it, a, to be as efficient as possible, you wanna kill the buffalo grass seedlings that come up before they put seeds on. Um, so that's really, in which they come up during the monsoon. So unless you're out there on your hands and knees, which Maryland does, uh, well, you'll hear that, that later. Uh, but um, pulling those tiny little seedlings, you can go through and with herbicide, very little herbicide, kill a lot of buffalo grass and exhaust the seed bank faster. And here's a Seuss Hill. This is on Tucson Mountain District. And there was a solid buffalo grass patch. And they, in 2012, they decided, and you can see these are people backpack spraying. There's the blue dye we use on that. So in 2012, they decided they were going to tackle it and they started spraying it. They didn't cover the whole hill in 2012, but it, so this is a map, a gridded map. If you're looking down on it, here's Sandario Road. Kinney Road comes in here, the visitor center's down there. So the data you'll see, it'll, it'll be a movie. And the darker the squares, this reddish rusty brown, I mean, there's lots of buffalo grass. And if it's very light, very little, or if there's nothing, we didn't record anything. So that's the movie will start in 2012. They just attacked a few places. And in 2013, they started trying to cover the whole hill. And you can see how, the buffalo grass declined over time. So 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, and we just had some people out a couple weeks ago, two people spent two days watering on this and they covered the whole thing with no sprayers, just pulling it. So we've got that to the place where it was huge solid mass of buffalo grass and then now two people and sprayers or two people without sprayers just a pick can, in a couple days can take care of it so it's going to in a maintenance state you know we'll have, have to be going there for a long time but um you know that's a success story but you do have to follow up and as julian mentioned you know the seeds live for a while in the soil you can't just try it well a year or two i've talked to people that said that i tried it it was in my yard i tried it a year or two and it just came back, so I gave up. But the seeds, you have to outlast the seeds. You just have to be persistent and you'll succeed. So this is the aerial survey of buffalo grass that we did and flew in a helicopter. And the red, uh, so every little blob on here is a patch of buffalo grass that we mapped. The red is high, above 50% cover. Yellow is moderate, 30 to 50% cover. And low is less than 30% cover. And you can see it's you know pretty. This is the, the tour loop. The visitor center would be like right here. This is Old Spanish Trail, Camino Loma Alta, if you're on that side of town. So it, there's a lot. Um, there were some big patches, very solid, and then some way down here, if you notice those. So then in 2019, we redid it, and that's what it looked like. A lot less red, much lower density. There's still buffalo grass almost in the same places. Um, but then you notice, and well, and down here, if you notice that that one is much bigger, it's still low, but it's low density, but it's spread quite a bit. But this one section in the middle here uh, has really increased in size and connectivity. And Julia talked about, you know, you can't, the odds of having a fire are small if you have these little small patches, but when you get these big patches, um, the odds of having a fire just go, just keep increasing. But so then the question is why, did it go from, you know, how do we get from here to that big blob when all the rest of this went down? Is because we had been aerially spraying. So these colors, the blues, yellows, that shows everywhere we sprayed since 2019 or 2014 through 2019. So the red has got sprayed the most, the, the dark blue got sprayed only once, so the cooler colors got sprayed less. So we've been kind of working from either side. We don't have enough money or time to cover the whole park. So this part in the center has never been treated. That's what it turned into if we didn't do anything. We were not pushing back on the ball right there and it just, you know, it's saturated a huge area and it's getting pretty ripe. That's about seven, 800 acres, pretty, pretty ripe for a fire now. So we do use glyphosate. So I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, it's really on the label, it's low toxicity. It's an eye irritant. The Park Service, we follow EPA guidance, and they say it is not a carcinogen. I mean, there's a lot of uh, different statements out there. It's hard to sort out who says what, but EPA says it's not a carcinogen. The European Food Safety Authority and the European Chemicals Agency say it is unlikely to cause cancer. 
But really the thing that got people's attention was when World Health Organization said it's a probable carcinogen. But in their system of classification, that's the same as eating fried food or working the night shift. And they, you know, they explain that it depends on the type of extent or type and extent of the exposure and the strength of it. So, so if you're exposed to like the, the concentrated mix that the farmer buys on a drum versus the stuff on the shelf at a big box store, that's different strengths. California considers it a known carcinogen, the same category as tobacco smoke. So, you know, if you eat one French fry or if you, somebody blows tobacco smoke on you, you're not going to get cancer. You know, it takes a lot of exposure if it is a carcinogen. And partly why it's hard, why all these studies disagree, here's an example of a study where they looked at several other studies, 25 different studies, some with the straight glyphosate and some with, you know, brand name um, that has other things in it, like the, the help the plant, stick to the plant, help penetrate the plant so it kills better. So they had rats and some of them, some, these studies all injected it with a needle into the rat, um, which I covered up because it's kind of disturbing, but, um, or they had it in their drinking water. These studies, 14 studies, found that it had some kind of effect on the genes, that on DNA. 11 studies found that it did not. But then also, if you look at the concentrations they were using for these studies, they're, this is the highest, 0 0.004 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So very little, just a tiny amount is what it's estimated that are in pesticide applicators that apply a lot. So there, these amounts are thousands of times greater than what people are actually exposed to, to get kind of mixed results. That's why people, you know, it's hard to, to straighten this out. This is a graph of the proxy of glyphosate use over time with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, over time, and that's from the 70s for the US, it's in, per 100,000 people, it's steady increase, and then it's kind of flattened off and going down. But this is Roundup Ready soybeans. So this is the type of soybean that was bred, genetically modified, so it could tolerate glyphosate so the farmers could just spray it on the crop and they'd kill the weeds and not the soybeans. So now it's went from nothing in the mid 90s to almost 100% of the soybeans are Roundup Ready. So that's, they're getting hit with Roundup. So glyphosate use skyrocketed and that cancer rate did not. If it really was that strongly tied, you would expect it to, um, cancer rate to have shot up. So we have, you know, that invasion curve, there's different tools at different parts of the invasion curve. Now here you got that one that was just introduced and up here you have a totally saturated hillside, totally covered. Uh, so in that small group, there's, there's uh, the weed free trail volunteer can go out and find those new colonies and uh, and we have volunteer poles and we have the paid staff volunteers we spray with backpack sprayers and then we have the boom sprayers on those saturated habitats and then now we have that spot sprayer that we work in between and someday that could be using drones so there's some websites the park website bufflegrass.org uh, hosted by the desert museum has a lot of information and uh, Save Our Soil Worlds is the hashtag if you do social media. There's my contact information if you need to get a hold of me. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you very much, Perry. That was a lot of good information. I learned a lot. Now, what I'd like to do is introduce Marilyn Hansen, and she has been involved with the Sonoran Desert Weed Whackers for 20 years. Marilyn. Well, I'm thrilled to be able to tell the story of the Sonoran Desert Weed Whackers. This group has been working since 2000, removing buffalo grass from S Tucson Mountain Park. Doug Siegel, who works for Pima County as the natural resource specialist, is the one that supplies the tools, the gloves, the transportation to the various sites, and he's the one that decides where we are going to be heading out. The group, as you can see, is an older group of people and mostly the dedicated volunteers that come out month after month are over 55, over 60 years old, 
Some are retired, some are still working. Our main goal is to contain the spread of buffalo grass and fountain grass. We have worked in the washes and up at the mountaintops. We're trying to prevent the buffalo grass from reestablishing in areas that we've cleared. And sometimes that means returning three, four, five times before it's totally cleared over the years. And of course, what we're trying to do is to preserve this incredible Sonoran Desert. We're trying to protect the native plants from being enveloped by the invasive grasses. If you look at the map in the lower right, Tucson Mountain Park is the green area, and that is over 35,000 acres. And we have covered a good portion of that. So what does weed whacking look like in Tucson Mountain Park? First of all, the grass is straw bale yellow. That's, the, that's how we describe the color. It's dormant in the winter, filled with seed heads. And in the summer, it'll be a lush green grass, also covered with seed heads. And we work year round, three times a month, starting in the summer at six o'clock. In the winter, we start at uh, eight. And this is a before and after where you can see the buffalo grass is spread across the slope when it's all piled and rocked, which is what this is. The um, area is filled with boulders and it's pretty, in some cases, it's pretty slippery. This is Cat Mountain, which is east of Tucson Estates, north of Ajo Highway. And we walked in, it took us a half an hour to get up to the slope. But you can tell it's a 45 degree slope and then some. So we're pulling out the buffalo grass. We're putting it in piles, which is over on the right hand side about the middle of the picture. And we put rocks on it to keep it from rolling down the slope or from blowing away. We had to return to this slope a couple times, but then eventually it was cleared. We've also worked on Bushmaster Peak, which is north of Gates Pass Road, starting from the overlook to a mile to the entrance to the park to the east. And we have cleared that slope uh, three or four times. And now there's almost no buffalo grass on that slope. The picture on the left is certainly after the monsoons and you get this lush green lawn and the same area cleared, once again, the buffalo grass is piled on, on the rocky slope. We've also worked the slopes west of the Marriott Star Pass Resort. On that mountaintop, we went up there and cleared 2012, cleared again a second time 2013. And then our attention was directed to other places throughout the park. And as a, as, as a result, the buffalo grass on that slope came back full bore. So in December of 2017, the group systematically cleared that slope piece by piece, and then they re-cleared, and then they re-cleared. And in December 19, 2019, and group went up and there was almost no buffalo grass. They were pulling up seedlings. So that is another success story. Starting in 2007, I learned how to map the weed whacking efforts in Google Maps. Every dot on this map represents a weed whacker outing. And and I still do this, so there's over 4,000 events recorded at this time. The database behind these dots contain the date, the location, the number of volunteers, the volunteer hours, and I also maintain a website which has photo reports for a good number of these outings starting from 2008, and I'm continuing that as well. Between about 2008 to 2014, I was maintaining a map where 
that showed where the neighborhoods were gathering volunteers and working and clearing out fountain grass and buffalo grass from their alleys, their yards, the parks, the washes. And you can see that there was a considerable effort throughout the city trying to clear out these invasive grasses. And if you look at the number of volunteer hours from 2002 to 2019, add them all up, and at the federal rate currently of $25 an hour, the value of the weed whackers in Tucson Mountain Park is over a million dollars. That's quite a substantial effort. One of the questions I frequently get is how much buffalo grass have you removed? And to tell you the truth, that's a difficult question to answer. But in 2008, while we were still bagging the buffalo grass, we don't do that anymore. But if you consider one African elephant unit is equivalent to seven tons. The work in 2014 was equivalent to four elephant units removed or 28 tons. From 2000 to 2014, it was equivalent to 600 elephant units removed or 4,200 tons. It's a lot of buffalo grass. So we have a choice. Are we going to clear the slopes and get rid of the buffalo grass? Or are we going to have a view that looks like this? This is the fireworks display, a picture from the fireworks display as Julia mentioned. And after the fireworks, this is the view, and you can see the charred ground on the lower right. The charred ground indicates an area where the fire was particularly hot, and the native seeds that were in the soil have been burned out. Certainly some of the saguaros have been burned out. And we can decide to do nothing, or we can decide that maybe we can protect Tucson Mountain Park. And that is what the weed whackers are doing. They have cleared from 2000 to 2019, 2020, they're still doing it, in the washes and up to the mountaintops. So that when you drive out to the Desert Museum, you do not see buffalo grass or fountain grass in your viewscape. And basically the weed whackers have taken a responsibility to protect Tucson Mountain Park so that we have views like this. Thank you very much. And back to you, Vivian. Thank you very much. That was very impressive on what your group has done. I especially like the map that you showed with all the different areas that the weed whackers have been active. Very impressive. And now I'd like to introduce Bridget Walters, who's an eighth grade student, and she has been on two buffalo grass and fountain grass poles. Hello, I'm Bridget Walters. I am an eighth grader. I have two success stories to share. One of them was when I was in seventh grade, and another one was this February. My first story, so I was inspired to lead a buffalo grass poll at my school when I read the buffalo grass, the buffalo busters magazine when, that I got for my mom's work. So I had to do a presentation in English class on whatever topic that I liked. So I figured I might as well present on buffalo grass. So I had to do more research on it for the presentation and I learned how bad it is and, fountain, and that fountain grass is just as bad. So in seventh grade, I led a buffalo grass poll at my school. Kega 9 came out and did a story on the poll, which is good because it helps to raise awareness about the topic. We went, I went back this year to try to find a new spot to poll, and there was no more buffalo grass on the site where we polled, which was most likely because the landscapers laid rock over the area, but it's a good thing nonetheless. We discovered a sphinx moth and a king snake in the area, and we also discovered a rattlesnake, when the, which was conveniently right as the fire department that was volunteering showed up. 
We got supplies from Tucson Clean and Beautiful. Melanie, my mom's coworker, donated tons of kids' gloves, and Doug Siegel of Pima County. He came and picked up all of the bags for us. We had over 30 volunteers, a few kids from my school and their parents, Fire Metro Station 80, a sorority from the U of A, and some regular Rufflegrass pullers. Then I wanted to do a poll for Save Our Saguaro's Month 2020, but there was no more ruffle grass or fountain grass to pull at my school because as I said earlier, the landscapers went back in and put in rock. So I asked Julia Rowe at the Desert Museum for a pole site and she suggested Coronado National Forest because there was a wash where she had been working with other volunteers near Pima Canyon. We found some trash while we went there and picked that up too. Here's a map of the area we there's the area we pulled that was circled in blue. The, the news also came out for this year's poll as well to help spread further awareness. This year we drew names for our volunteers and the lucky volunteer won a baby saguaro. So they took that home with them. Bufflegrass and cotton grass are very invasive and fast spreading species, but it can be removed if we try hard and work together to eradicate buffalo and fountain grass from our Tucson ecosystem. Thank you so much for your time. Now back to you, Vivian. Thank you very much, Bridget. That was excellent. So a number of questions that we have. Uh, now here's a question for Perry. Are native grasses being reintroduced at pole sites? Um, yes, we've just started. It's, uh, there's been a lot of attempts at restoration, restoring disturbed areas in the deserts, and generally it doesn't work because our climate is so harsh and, and it's unpredictable. You'll have no rain for a long time, then you get a big rain and it'll wash every, all the seeds away. So we've started making seed balls, which are a mix of seed, clay, and organic matter and making little balls on our, and when we're done with the pole then the volunteers uh, put some down and it, it does include some grasses it includes kind of a mix of the species that are from that general area but it's we just started it last winter it's an experiment and really the unless you have really big buffalo grass patches that have been there for a long long time there are still native seeds in the soil so they should come back but we're trying to give it a little boost so um, a lot of this, this is an unprecedented problem for everybody. The, de the Sonoran Desert being converted to a grassland that can burn at a drop of a hat. So we're all just kind of making it up as we go and experimenting. It's one huge experiment. We're having to watch and learn the whole time. Excellent, thank you. Julia, uh, one of our audience says, I would like to organize a volunteer weed whacker group in my neighborhood. How do I start a volunteer group? That is a fantastic question. Um, I have been working with a number of different groups to get volunteer groups up and going. If anyone wants to get a group going, we have some resources on our website. And you can also reach out to me either at jrowe at desertmuseum.org. Or if you forget that, you can also email bufflegrass at desertmuseum.org and it will go to me. Um, one of the things to really make sure of is that you can identify buffalo grass specifically because even in neighborhoods there's native grasses that be, can be confused for it. We certainly don't want to pull those out. Um, but there's resources where you can borrow tools and we're even willing to come out uh, for the first time or two to, to get you going too. So uh, definitely reach out for resources on that. All right, thank you. Marilyn, a question for you is how strong does a person have to be to pull buffalo grass? I'm out there with usually about 10 other people. And I'm the person that takes the pictures and does GPS. We have other folks that use rock hammers. They don't have to use rock, um, the big uh, bars. And, and other folks can just pile the grasses. Once the weed whackers get going, piling the grass and putting rocks on top of the piles is a very helpful thing to do because those folks with the bars can keep digging. Marilyn, what happens after you pile the buffalo grass? How do you get it out of there? We don't move it. 
we, as you can tell on the pictures, sometimes those slopes are really steep. Sometimes we've taken 45 minutes to walk into a site. And so we pile it on site, put rocks on it, and it decomposes over time. And we can usually tell looking at the old piles how many years it's been since we were last at that site. All right, thank you. Perry, a question for you. What is the impact of spraying on the native plants? Yeah, glyphosate, the, one, the herbicide we use is a broad spectrum, so it affects a lot of plants. When we're spraying on the ground, it's selective though because the person is controlling where they're spraying. Sometimes we accidentally spray something you know, like a tangle head, a native grass that looks like it and it's right next to it, we spray it by accident. But backpack spraying, it's pretty easy to control. Aerial spraying, we use the boom sprayer and the really big patches where there's not a lot of natives. So we're not spraying that many. And it, and it varies by species, like saguaros, um, that the, the reaction that that herbicide interferes with in the plant that ends up killing them, that's in a lot of plants, but saguaros, it has a waxy cuticle, so that chemical cannot really penetrate that well. So you'll see a little maybe like cigar burns, cigarette burns in them, just a few. And it depends, and sometimes there'll be one right next to another one that shows some effect and some, some will show another. And the more years you do it, the more the impact you have. Palo Verde is little leaf Palo Verde. It, it will kill the twigs that it hits, a few of the twigs, but it, it does not translocate it through the plant. Like buffalo grass takes it down into the root, it kills the root, kills the plant. The Palo Verde, it just seems to stay in the twig and the twig will die. Blue Palo Verde, although there's not very many of them where we're spraying, it seems to be hit harder. Uh, mm -hmm. Brittle bushes hit pretty hard. Native grasses are hit pretty hard. Um, and it's, it's a whole spectrum between almost as much as buffalo grass gets hurt and practically nothing. So that's one thing we're having to monitor is these areas we've been spraying for a long time. Is there seed bank? Is it coming back? Or is it going to need some help from us? But yeah, we're monitoring and then it does affect some things, but it doesn't affect it as much as buffalo grass will in the long run. With well, that's good to hear. Buffalo that's grass good. is going to eradicate everything else eventually. Yeah. Here's a couple more questions about spraying. Is it necessary to pull out the buffalo grass after it's been sprayed? No, after it depends. After it's died from spraying. Even? Yes, yeah, it, it depends on your, I mean, if it's right next to your house, you spray it and kill it, you're gonna have a bunch of dead buffalo grass there, so you might wanna pull it. It'd be easier just to pull it to start with, but if you're way up on a ridge somewhere, um, we don't pull it, you don't have to. It's gonna die in place and it actually may help prevent other seedlings, buffalo grass seedlings from germinating immediately because there's still, the ground is still shaded. Okay. Um, you know, it is a fire hazard because it's dead, but it's a fire hazard nine months of the year when it's brown. So in over about three years, it decomposes just like the pile buffalo grass. It turns gray, the leaves fall off. And after about three years, it's not really a fire hazard anymore. Okay. Another question about spraying, is the helicopter spraying method allowed in the wilderness areas when there are restrictions from using power tools? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, yes, most of the park, Saguaro National Park is designated wilderness and you're not supposed to use tools, but that the Wilderness Act allows exemptions and you go through a planning process and you look at the alternatives. Um, and you know, we went through the planning process and we were allowed to use a helicopter there, which is pretty, it is pretty weird to think about using a helicopter to spray herbicide in a national park in wilderness, but I mean, it's a necessary tool. And without, without it, the saguaros and everything are gonna be lost and, and you're not gonna have saguaros in the Saguaro National Park. So, uh, and, and it's not very natural. And that's the purpose of wilderness is to protect naturalness. So it's a, it's a balancing act. We, you know, we have to do it. If we didn't have to, we definitely would not be doing it. All right, thank you. Bridget, uh, I have a question for you. So what are you doing to introduce outings about buffalo grass to your classmates? So when I go to University High School, I plan to start a environmental club, or if there's already an existing one, I'd like to join it. And I would like to help negotiate buffalo grass poles from there. When are you going to University High School? Next year. 
Oh, you'll be in the ninth grade? Yeah. Oh, you'll be in the ninth grade. Excellent. Very good. All right. So, um, Marilyn, I'd like to know, um, can service groups join in the weed whacking effort for just one outing? And I'd like to have Julia address that because she is the person along with Sonia at the Desert Museum that takes those groups out. All right, thank you. Julia, uh, can service groups join in the weed whacking effort for one outing? Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of different groups around the Tucson Basin. Um, not too many are going out right now because, you know, it was 104 yesterday. But there are groups that still go out through the summer, such as Maryland's group. But we try to have all of those groups put their efforts on our Desert Museum web page. So we have a spot where anybody can go and look and see um, what group that they would like to join. There's oftentimes polls at Catalina State Park and others, and they will always have what their maximum capacity of people is. And if you have an especially large group that you can't find a poll for, again, you can contact me and I can almost always find a spot for you to pull and get you, you know, hooked up with a group to go with. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a question either for uh, Julia or Perry, I don't know. This is a person who lives at Pantano and Seneca, and it's, uh, she has a homeowners association, Seneca Terrace, and she says, it appears we have invasive grasses on Pantano. I understand the city does weed removal there. How can I have someone look at it and give our homeowners association, which is Seneca Terrace, uh, an analysis of the pro problem. So that's, that's an interesting question. Um, it's a little bit specific to answer uh, over this call, but I would say um, I would be willing to help them figure out who is responsible for taking care of that land that, where they're worried about it. Um, I'm always welcome, I always welcome people to send me pictures if they're not sure whether it's uh, buffalo or fountain grass. I, I love the what is this grass game. Um, you can always send me pictures asking that. And we do also offer talks to HOAs. We're happy to come out and talk to your HOA about um, the problem of buffalo grass and we can make it more specific to your area if, you know, if people already know what it is, we can, you know, and make it a bit more advanced too and talk about how to proceed. So I would love for them to reach out to me. Um, again, it's at uh, jrowe at desertmuseum.org. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Perry, here's a question for you. Uh, what programs are ongoing this summer and also what precautions about the virus are being taken? Yeah, that's a good question. And the park, we normally stop um, during the summer. Our vo volunteer polls are October to April because it's too hot. And um, yeah, it's just too hot. But we have Weed Free Trail volunteers. There are individual volunteers that go on their own whenever they want. And there's a few that do work in the summer. Um, we don't, and we have a training. We need to, for people to be wandering around, not wandering, purposefully seeking out buffalo grass. Uh, we have to do training and that's in the fall. So somebody, if they're not already a volunteer, they would need to wait until the fall. And in terms of COVID, um, yeah, we're, we'll have plans in place. Um, we'll, a few people per vehicle or one per vehicle, everybody take their own, bring their own gloves if possible. And we can, we have a sanitizer that we can use. Plus just with time, if, if we do it once a month, then, uh, there's no virus alive on the tool by the time the next person uses it. And, and depending on how it's going, well, we may not do anything at all if it really gets bad, but I hope you know, that we're better by then, by October, um, you know, wearing a face mask and the standard mitigations. Staying six feet apart. Yep. Right. So I just, want to, oh, sorry, I just wanted to add that Pima County is still running um, pulls through the summer. They start, uh, you know, quite a bit earlier because it's, you know, really hot. 
um, and they are taking a lot of measures to deal with COVID. They're, um, they're wiping down all of their tools. They're making sure people are six feet apart. They're giving out gloves, but if you take their gloves, you take them home um, because those are just harder to, to disinfect. And um, yeah, and they're not piling people into vehicles. So they have a whole list of, of uh, actions that they're taking to deal with COVID. But fortunately, digging buffalo grass is one of those activities that really lends itself to being able to be distant this, you know, it's been already been shown that the sun breaks down the virus really quickly. It's, you know, and it's good for our bodies to be out moving and, and outside. So, um, yeah, so the Pima County's, the, the weed whackers that Marilyn talked about are still going out and they are taking a lot of precautions. So you can join them if you want. Excellent. Thank you. Bridget, I have a question for you. Where can people get the Buffalo Busters magazine? I know that I got mine from ADQ, from the um, from the people that like hand out that go to sometimes they go to schools and they hand out magazines or coloring books. You could probably also find it online if you wanted to, but it's a pretty short coloring book, an activity book. How old were you when you first got yours? I was seven, I think. Oh, pretty, sure. pretty young. Pretty young. Yeah. Well, good for you because uh, that helped you to be able to look at things that you could do now and in the future in your life. And I think that's great. Yeah. And it was cool at my pool this year, a six-year-old came and she was like helping pull out like the little seedlings. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Very good. So it's for all ages. Yeah. Julia, thank you. Julia, here's a question for you. Why focus on saguaros uh, when there are many native species in the Sonoran Desert ecosystem that are important too? Well, that's a really good question. For a lot of years, um, when, uh, you know, before, actually even before, before I started working on this problem, the main focus when we talked about this issue was beat back buffalo grass. And a lot of you might remember, we always had beat back buffalo grass day. Um, and so we've changed the focus to save our saguaros because one, if somebody is not particularly interested in weed science, then beat back buffalo grass, they don't, it's, it's harder to get people that aren't already involved to care. And we picked the saguaro specifically because that's something that's so iconic to this area. Um, it's one, it's one that everybody knows and everybody really loves, but also it's such a keystone species, which means it's a species that's really important to a lot of other animals. Um, so we, it's clearly buffalo grass impacts all the native plants and all the native animals in an area. But we picked Save Our Saguaros just to really hone that focus and to reach out to people that aren't necessarily already ecologists or, you know, you know, that don't have that much information. Wasn't there concern that saguaros were already dying out even before buffalo grass came? I'm not aware of that concern. I know that saguaros tend to have a cyclical um, new saguaro sprouting cycle mm -hmm. so you can have um you know you can have a, a lot of years where you don't have many new saguaros and then you'll have a you know a couple of years where you have a lot of new ones so i'm not i'm not completely sure what was going on with the ecosystem before you know say the late 90s because that's when we started really having a lot of trouble with buffalo grass mm -hmm. vivian if i could just say about the saguaros on saguaro national park um, it was determined that, you know, saguaros were declining, you know, the photos from the 30s, there were huge saguaro forests, and they were declining because of cattle grazing and wood cutting for their people, cutting wood for, for town, for firewood, and for oh. making lime. Mm -hmm. So, what, and the wood, the Palo Verdes and the mesquites, those were the nursery trees. So, they just, they became much less favorable. Um, so, there was a long period with not much um, reproduction going on in Saguaro National Park and since grazing was removed and of course no wood cutting, there is a lot more reproduction going on. But it is cyclical. There'll be like a episode of like a wet period of wet years and you have a lot of 
baby swirls and then um, dry periods, not that much. Okay, that's good to know. Another uh, question for you, Perry, is, is buffalo grass still being promoted by range managers as a good forage crop? In places, you know, in Arizona, it's a noxious weed, so it's, it wouldn't be legal to sell the seed anymore. Uh, it used to be sold as seed here. But in Texas, they, you know, it's a valuable forage crop. There's people that still sell the seed in Mexico. You know, they raise a lot of cattle mm -hmm. on it. Australia, there's a uh, kind of conflict between conservationists and ranchers that the ranchers are planting it and then the conservationists are trying to preserve the native habitat. So in places, yes, but not in Arizona. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, one more question. Um, what percentage of all the buffalo grass has been removed in our area? Wow. What's a guess on your part? For the whole area, the whole basin, I mean, some areas are not being treated, so it's increasing. Other areas, I think generally the trend is downward. The park, we estimated we had 2,000 acres. Mm, uh, I don't know. Marilyn has pulled more than I have. She might know. Marilyn, what's your thought about that? I would say in Tucson Mountain Park, working concentratedly for 20 years, re-clearing and re-clearing, and of course, we don't have acreage figures. Okay. But when you look at that map, we have covered a lot of Tucson Mountain Park mm -hmm. and re cleared and re cleared a lot. So, Tucson Mountain Park, I would definitely say the trend is going down. And fountain grass, it's rare for us to find any fountain grass in Tucson Mountain Park anymore. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right, so there are successes. Absolutely. So do you ever feel frustrated um, as a weed whacker that you have to keep going back to the same location year after year after year? My response to that is there are so many successes out there that when we clear a spot, Bushmaster Peak was an enormous effort. Mm -hmm. Take 45 minutes to get up to the slope where the buffalo grass was. Mm -hmm. And we re cleared and re cleared and re cleared for a mile of that slope. And now, when you look at that slope, there's almost no buffalo grass there. Wonderful. Yeah. And that is a success story. You keep at it for four or five years, and it's gone. So yeah, I feel we've definitely made successes in Tucson Mountain Park. Excellent. Yeah, Vivian, if I could just say yes. also, immediately after the pull, when you walk up to an area and it's buffalo grass, and you know, there's saguaros and ocotillos peeking out of buffalo grass, and when you get done for the day, it looks like a totally different place. So that mm -hmm. short term, there is like immediate short term reward for, that, right. for the work that you just put in. And I could see that from the photos that people had the before and after, that was excellent. I wanted just to add too that when you do go back the next year or the next season and you keep going back, one of the things that makes that um, not so arduous is that you get to see the native plants coming back in. Mm -hmm. And every time you go back, as long as you keep doing it, you get to see more wildflowers and you get to see more things coming in that were never there to start with. So there's some, there's some benefits to having to go back every time. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, Bridget, I have a question for you. Is your concern about buffalo grass saved? Uh, is that shared by your family and friends? Yes, I have had my family has been coming out to the polls with me, and then a couple of my friends are also coming, making it out. And in 2019, in my 2019 poll, one of my friends brought out some snacks, and then we brought waters and stuff Excellent. for people. Do you have any polls planned for the future? Uh, February of next year, most likely. Uh -huh. And then if COVID isn't as bad as it is now, of course, we'll be staying six feet apart, but we'll see what happens. Okay. Are you going to go back to Julia to find out where she suggests to pull them? Uh, I might go back to the spot that we pulled this year to uh -huh. look at that place. And then I think I'll also check at my school again, just to make sure that it's gone. Excellent. Uh, one other question for you, Bridget. 
Are there other environmental concerns that you want to share with our audience that are important to you? Um, I feel like limiting, I did a project for a robotics team a while back and it found that recycling cardboard was actually, it used a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. And so we created like a solution where you can like put your label over your box. So reusing the boxes is better mm -hmm. than just recycling them because when you recycle them, it uses a lot of energy to do that. So if we get the most uses out of a box as possible, that's good. All right, thank you. That's a, an interesting one. I know the city is working on uh, recycling glass. So yeah. that's something that's happening too. Good. Perry, you get the last two questions. Why don't you use less toxic herbicides like vinegar? Um, we get that question a lot, actually. And actually, can I share my screen and I'll show, I have a slide about it. Okay. That I have kind of at the end, just in case. I, I had my slide talk was really long. Vinegar, um, it's, and it's not really, you know, I'd heard that too. People have been telling me that, that somebody had told me that they had killed, you know, adult buffalo grass with vinegar. So I ordered some from where they said they got it. And uh, I didn't read the label when I bought it, but the, right away the, it's not really vinegar. It's 20% acid content where vinegar is usually five. So it's heavy duty vinegar, I guess. But the warning sign or signal word on it is danger. And the label for this one, uh, it's a herbicide vinegar says ca causes irreversible eye damage so you got to wear eye protection for sure and then the environmental hazards on it says it's toxic to birds and either on direct treatment or even on the residue and i don't know why something about bird um, metabolism but so it's not even everything has some kind of effect um, so glyphosate really as is pretty low toxicity. We are looking for other things. We're trying, and sometimes it's not the, the glyphosate itself that's in the herbicide, but it's the things that go with it. Usually they're petroleum based. So that's what makes them more toxic or more mutagenic effects possibly, or you know, causes DNA damage. So we're trying to find the least possible, least toxic glyphosate mixture that we can find also. And, and there's, Anyway, there's not a lot out there. It's amazing, but, but that's why glyphosate is so popular. It's fairly innocuous, okay. relatively speaking. Well, one other question is, are scientists working on alternatives to manual removal or herbicides that you're aware of? Um, no, there, well, biocontrol is one option, you know, where you find an organism that, that eats it or destroys it and you release it, but that's really long process and because it's a grass you know there's no telling you know if it could be jumped to the wrong species and there is a research into using the compounds that those organisms produce to kill use that like a biologically derived herbicide um, and so far the tests have found that it but fairly very limited early stage testing that it was actually kind of selective so mm. maybe a different whole thinking on what is a herbicide. All right, I want to thank our panelists today, Julia Rowe, Perry Grissom, Marilyn Hansen, and Bridget Walters. You all did an excellent job. And now I'd like to show you where you can get involved. This is very important. What you can do. First of all, educate yourself. Learn to recognize buffalo grass and other invasive species in your neighborhood, in your yard. I have a wash that goes on the side of my house and I'm going to be looking at that to see if buffalo grass is there. You can go to Save Our Saguaro's website, desertmuseum.org slash grass. So I do want to point out to you that uh, this this presentation is going to be on the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson YouTube channel and about mid-June. So if you don't write down all of these details now, you can get that information from our YouTube channel in 
uh, at the, about the, the middle of June. Save Our Saguaro's website at the Sonoran Desert Museum is an amazing resource for you to increase your understanding of this terrible problem. Go to the resources tab. You can find information on learning to identify buffalo grass, but the best way is to join a buffalo grass pool for hands-on learning. So the second thing is to help educate others in your personal network your family, your friends, your church group, your recreational group, um, anybody else that you know that you could work with to look at these invasive species and look at the areas in your area and in your neighborhood and see what you can do about that. You can organize a poll with your neighborhood organization, your uh, homeowners association. Notify your local government officials, the city or the county uh, officials, if you notice anything, uh, any site in your area. It can be parks, it can be vacant lots, construction tracks, development tracks where they're putting in houses or commercial properties, uh, roadsides. These are often places where the plants are. So notify the city or the county and let them know about this so they can take action and volunteer for the Weed Whacker Program. These are groups that are rearranging, um, they're rearranging their activities uh, because of the virus right now, the social distancing, wearing masks, but they are going to be working and uh, there are, they're in different geographic areas. So please contact them and let them know that you're interested. One is the Sonoran Desert Weed Whackers. They generally work on the third Saturday and the second and fourth Wednesdays all year long. The person to contact is D Doug Siegel, Doug, D-O-U-G dot Siegel, S-I-E-G-E-L at Pima.gov or Marilyn Hansen at M-F Hansen, H-A-N-S-O-N at com Comcast.net. And you can ask me, added to their mailing list. The Tortolito Weed Whackers is organized by Stanley Ross. You can contact Stanley at shr90602 at gmail.com. And they're going to start again in September. So uh, volunteers need to be in good physical condition and willing to work on rough terrain. So, and also the Catalina Buffalo Slayers, what a great name. They take typically meet between November and April, and they're in this photo right here. So for more information about when they meet, contact uh, Petty Estes at Estes, E-S-T-E-S, -E at email.arizona.edu. You can get more information about other groups at Desert Museum, www.desertmuseum.org slash bufflegrass slash Pull index, P U L L I N D E X dot P H P. You can support appropriate buffalo grass control organizations with a monetary donation to help advance their work. And that goes for staff, that goes for gloves, that goes for masks, that goes for uh, all the tools that it takes to get out buffalo grass. Also, voice your approval of and appreciation for groups, both governmental and non-governmental, that work to protect the precious natural habitats that make the Tucson area so special. Look, more beautiful saguaros. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Vivian Hart with the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. This voter education program was uh, also co-sponsored by the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, and the Arizona Native Plant Society. So please check our YouTube channel sometime in June 2020, hopefully around the middle of June, and you can see this. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate you being with us today, and we hope that you come back and see more of our voter education programs. Bye-bye. <laughs>